Uh, another week, another Saturday, another opportunity to answer your running questions. And like we started last week, all of the questions, and I have not done the editing for uh, spelling or grammar, but they are listed down below. Literally, I'm copying and pasting your questions from, well, this week we're focusing on YouTube. Uh, next week we will do like Facebook and Twitter, etc., etc. All right, so they're posted down below in the description. I don't have time right now to do timestamps, uh, but at least you know the order that I'm going in. Let's dive in. Hope you had a great week. Onward and upward. All right, here we go. Question number one. How do you introduce lower body strength training while still still performing so many runs? That is from Alan. Alan, great question. Alan, I'm going through this right now. So, Alan, my tip for introducing strength training is to add it into your routine before your volume starts to get too high. Because, Alan, I completely get it. When my legs are tired, the last thing I want to do is go to the gym and do some leg strengthening or even core work at the gym. So, Alan, what I'm doing through this running, this uh, runner's knee right now, I'm introducing the key essential elements of leg strength and core work while I feel fresh because I'm not running right now. And the trick, Alan, is the mental toughness once you start, once, but the, okay, so you gotta start the habit, right? The routine of the lower body strength exercises in the gym. And then if you get that routine down and get that habit in, and it's like, it's penciled into your calendar, no matter what, you're gonna go to the gym even when your legs are dead tired. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I've done in the past. But Alan, I'm just totally transparent. I have struggled in the past with introducing leg strengthening work if I introduce it too, too late in a training block. So you got to start it at the beginning, if not uh, before your, your training block even begins. Okay, Alan, that's my little tip. Great question. I love it. Okay, question number two. Here we go from Ronald. Cadence versus stride length. What's your opinion? What's faster? Increasing the cadence, increasing the stride length. That's from Ronald. Ronald, um, my opinion is cadence is better. So how many, how many, for those that don't know, it's how many times your feet strike the ground, let's say over a minute, okay? And Ronald, um, I have heard and, and read that when you increase your stride length um, too much, it can lead to injuries, okay? If you're stride, and you frankly, again, my opinion, you don't want your, you don't want to be over striding uh, in your gait cycle because again, it can lead to injuries and um, I, okay, the biomechanics side, oh gosh, how to summarize it. Um, Mm, Ronald, I'm going to leave it at that. My opinion is cadence, okay? So quicker feet is better. That's a, okay. Ronald, you got me thinking here. I'm going to make a vlog. I'm going to do a little more research on cadence versus stride length. I don't think I've ever made a vlog just on that topic. It's a great one, but that's my short answer. Cadence, cadence, cadence. Okay, moving on. Question number three from Rick. Do you can, would I consider the Paris Marathon in April? Rick, I would. Here's the trick, everyone, with this whole marathon deal. Uh, I don't, <laughs> as soon as registration closes, it's really, from based on my experience, it's really difficult to find the right connections and the right contact through like getting access to a race director. And usually the race director has people underneath him, two or three people who are in charge of, let's say, the sub elites, where I would, you know, I'm just, I'll say, I'll, I think I could put myself into that category with a 223. Um, Rick, I'm beyond, I would be beyond open to Paris. Um, I think the course is pretty good, but, uh, yeah, that's my short, that's my, that's my answer, Rick, for you. I'm searching, I'm searching is the bottom line. Okay, question number four. Any thoughts on ice skating for cross training? Like last week, I'm going to pivot to everybody, uh, up in Russia, Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, who else is up north? Even maybe northern Japan, wherever you live and there's ice skating, I would say, I would say it's good, like the speed skating, you know, where you go around those big, just like normal ice skating, probably not, but uh, the speed skating, absolutely. Those folks have incredible um, VO2 maxes based, uh, based on quote, the research I've, I've done, meaning when I watched the Winter Olympics, I remember hearing stats of those guys is, uh, and ladies' VO2 maxes being off the charts. So, okay, moving on. Question five. I love high weekly volume, 70 to 100 miles for marathon training. Uh, would you ever incorporate 27 to 30 mile training runs? That's from Brett. Brett, I probably would, Brett. But I think, Brett, the better 
strategy is that 22 to 24 range only because it depends on what you're going for. Um, if you want to add some speed into your legs, if you're running 27 miles in a training run, ugh, your legs are going to like, unless you're just an incredible, incredible athlete, your legs are going to be shot. They're going to be tired for, I don't know, I'm just going to say five days, six days, seven days, you know, depending on the speed you're running the 27 miles at. Brett, it's a good question. I do know some ultra marathoners who train at you know that type of volume in one day in one run um but my my strategy moving forward is that 22 to 24 mile range for the long run good question brett uh i'll leave it at that yeah good one okay number six going on here from oh i didn't write down the name my bad what are your tips for dealing with dealing with or preventing side stitches slash side cramps while running oh this is tough so anyone have those side stitches Based on my experience, it's a, oh man, it never, it hasn't happened to me in a long, long time, but I would say it's, it happens when I'm kind of coming back and I'm really kind of out of shape, um, is when side stitches might happen. When you're actually running, you always want to open up your chest cavity, so kind of lift your arms up and put them up and just kind of stretch it out, like if you even have to come to a stop and stop running, uh, just stretch it out. Also, I think side cramps can be connected to what you're eating. So maybe really dial in, like monitor what you're eating in the three, four hours leading up to your run. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I, I honest, I cannot remember the last time I had a side stitch, but I do just so. But my biggest tip would probably be, you know, just stretch it out. And um, yeah, maybe again, everyone could chime in down in the comments if you suffer from side stitches or side cramps. Moving on. Here we go from Anik. Uh, do you think the do you think that runners who race at a higher intensity get injured more often versus runners who race just to finish? I have noticed that over the years, my friends who run more for fun and don't follow a training plan log more consistent miles than someone who is trying to maximize their potential. That's from Anique. Oh, I would say yes. Runners who race at a higher intensity probably get injured more. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily because of the racing, though. I would say it's because of the training is at a pretty high level. So I'm just going to, that's that's my answer. Um, yeah, that's, I would say yes. Okay, moving on. Sorry, I'm not going to expand on that. But uh, all right, here we go. Christian, Seth, with no doubts, you are a great athlete. Oh, I appreciate it, Christian, and great runner. As far as I heard from your vlog, you have, like, you have about one injury a year, uh, like a big injury on average. Do you think that you push too much your body to run at a high level? Or do you think uh, these injuries are too much? I'm a believer to run injury free even higher times on my races. Uh, da, 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 da. I think so. He's basically wondering what is my like, do I think I train too hard at too high of intensity? Um, Christian, I would say probably yes. But again, I have high goals and my talent level isn't as high as some other runners. Okay. So Christian, for me, I'm willing to push myself and test that, you know, even with the runner's knee, like trying to chase down an Olympic trials qualifier. That's kind of insane. I get it. But I was willing to do it and I have no regrets making the attempt just so as long I can come back healthy eventually, which by the way, it's feeling really, really good right now. Um, so Christian, yeah, I probably do push myself too hard and I'm okay with it because I know at some point I will be able to have success. Um, I'll be able to reap kind of the rewards. Yeah, gosh, oh my, I have so many thoughts on this question. Christian, it's a good question, but I'm just gonna say, yeah, I probably do train at too high of an intensity, but it's in order to make up for a little, you know, may slight lack of talent level, all right? Moving on, Griffin says, what do you think about ultra running in the Olympics one day? Griffin, I love this question. Actually, when I was at the World Mountain Running Championships in Argentina, um, Jim, Hayden, myself, Mario, uh, David, we were all sitting around the table, Jim Walmsley, Hayden Hawks, big ultra marathon runners. We were sitting around the kitchen table, like chatting about this. And uh, we were kind of talking about, uh, we were talking about the logistics and like what, it's a big deal to add a new sport to the Olympics, even though now there's some sports that I'm like, huh, is that, should that really be in the Olympics? But I would say Griffin, I think it will be. I think ultra running continues to uh, get more and more attention on the big scene with respect to media. I hate to say it, Griffin, but a lot of it comes down to money. So can uh, the ultra running bring more spectators and viewers, eyeballs on the TV 
while the Olympics are going. And Griffin, my short, my quick answer is yes. I think over time we're going to see ultra running introduced into the Olympics. I bet it's at least three or four cycles away. And Griffin, we also talked about around that kitchen table, uh, the distance. My humble opinion is 100K. So basically it'd be the 100 mile distance versus the 50K distance. So basically the, the guys that are good at 100 milers and the guys that are good at 50Ks would need to meet in the middle right around 100K, okay? So that's my opinion on the distance that would end up in the Olympics, all right? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, number 10, Mark. How are you using the massage gun? I received one for Christmas and found that it is a great way to supplement foam rolling. Other thoughts on this, Mark? Mark, I love it. Now, Mark, I'm not running at a high level right now, so my body feels pretty good outside of the runner's knee. I am using it, Mark, I guess just to really answer your question, I am using it kind of as a trigger point on my quads, which again, especially my left quad, which is my runner's knee, which I've heard um, there's some situation, there's situations that happen in your quads that if you can loosen them up a big time, uh, your lower quads right above your knee, that can help with runner's knee. So Mark, I'm really, everyone, I'm really enjoying the massage gun. Um, so I will get a full review of the massage gun once I'm back to running and I'm, you know, I'm a little more sore and I'm actually using it more. Okay, good question. Okay, number 11 from Glenn. Here we go. A lot of good running watches given, give you a recommended recovery time. For example, I ran a 5K tempo and my watch suggested I recover for 36 hours. What's your opinion on this? And do you think it depends on running experience? That's from Glenn. Glenn, uh, let me just take a quick drink of water here. Mm-hmm. Glenn, I don't buy it. I just don't buy it with those running watches. Um, mine does that too, I think. I think the Polar Watch does it. Um, they don't, they, like, I know you enter data into the watch ahead of time, and I realize, like, I'm not the tech guy. Everyone knows that. I think it's a bunch of, you know what. I think it's not taking into account your, uh, your nutrition, your sleep patterns, your, uh, maybe it is, to, you know, if you wear your watch when you sleep, okay, so I gotta watch what I say, but like your nutrition, your sleep patterns, are you going to get a, going to a massage therapist? Uh, what surface are you running on? Um, it's like, there are so many factors that I don't agree with at all with, uh, and even like, okay, don't feel bad. Like watches are trying to make you feel bad. When it says, uh, my Polar watch I think says this, like I'm detraining, like, what you don't know how like the watch does not know what you're like maybe you're getting ready for a race and you're tapering um i just i i don't like it i don't like how the watches are trying to tell you how to train at all so glenn gets me a little fired up but um that's my that's my little rant for the day okay moving on question number 12 vlogs from alejandro hi seth i just wanted to ask which shoes do you think are the most durable for road running they can be shoes from 2018 or 2019 alejandro hands down, the Asics Glide Ride. And I feel like I've uh, influenced a lot of people to go out and buy that shoe because they're posting their pictures on Strava and on uh, Instagram. I love them still, everybody. And I, I'm glad, and the people so far, I haven't really heard any negative reviews, but if you have some bad reviews on the Asics Glide Ride, let us know down in the comments. So far, so good. I'm telling you, Vlogs by Alejandro, they are, they're just built to last. I, I don't know, and I've put like 130, which is actually miles into the, my pair, which is pretty high for me. And like the outsole looks totally fine. There's no real major compression at all through the midsole. The, the upper is built like a tank. Um, so that's my answer, Vlogs by Alejandro. The Asics Glide Ride, now they're a little heavy, I get it, but I'm, I'm loving them. I think it's gonna be a very hot shoe in 2020, depending on how they up, if they end up updating it. Moving on, question 13. Uh, the question about the one, oh yeah. Du, 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 du. Okay, this is a tough one, um, but this is from Graham. Are there any shoes that have been discontinued in the last couple years that you wish were still in production? Graham, I actually couldn't think of any. Um, I couldn't think of any. All my favorite shoes are still, are still going. Uh, yeah, but I will be interested actually to see if they if they update the Vomero 14 from Nike. Remember, my the tongue issue was a major issue for me last year, uh, just cutting into the top of my my foot. Um, so that was a major issue. But I will say, and then he goes on to ask Graham, or are there any shoes that have been updated, newer model of the same shoe that you felt isn't as good as their predecessors? So I know this might ruffle feathers, but I prefer the Beacon One upper 
over the Beacon 2 upper. We've talked about this before. I just like, um, I think the Beacon 2 upper is a little more cheaply, it's not made as well, and it's scrunching up so much through the toe box. Now I realize if you need a lot of volume uh, through your toe box because you just got a big, kind of big knuckle uh, toes, a lot of a lot going on in, the, in your forefoot, then yeah, this might work better for you. Um, I don't mind the heel counter on the Beacon V2. It's, it's not, I, I like it, it's, it's fine. But overall, I like the upper better on the V1. And then the Turbo 1 to Turbo 2 from Nike, I prefer the Turbo 1. Yeah, and again, it comes down to the upper. Is, here's the Turbo 2 upper. Um, this is the Turbo 2 upper. And yeah, basically it's the heel counter I was digging into my, um, my Achilles tendon, which I think some other people said it was as well for them. So that's my answer, Graham. Hope it helps. Moving on, one more. This, one, this week was a little quicker. And my running related question, have you ever considered getting a coach? That is from Paige. And Paige, I've talked about this in the past. The reason I enjoy coaching myself, first of all, time. Um, I love being efficient and using my time how I like to, like rather than going to meet a coach somewhere for a workout, um, I can do my workout from my house or yeah, drive to where I wanna drive. It's, you know, um, so time. And then more, more page is I like to test different ways of training so that someday I can apply the lessons I'm learning to other athletes. When I hopefully am a coach down the road, um, I, it's tinkering. It's figuring out like, okay, this, this volume worked with this amount of intensity, this amount of elevation gain. For example, here we go, Paige. My runner's knee, my thesis, my thesis as to why I picked up runner's knee, there's, there's, always, there's a lot of different factors, but I think one of them, Paige, my legs are skinny, skinny, chicken, chicken legs right now because I have not been up into the mountains in three months. When I transitioned from the mountain running to road marathons, um, basically the last mountain running I did, well, I did a little bit after New York City, but Paige, I think my quad strength went way, way, way down um, after I left the mountains. And then I started going a little faster in order to chase down the 219 on the roads down here in Denver. And I, th based on the research I've done, uh, weak quads can lead to runner's knee because your knee ends up taking more of the brutal, uh, the brutal, the brute impact of the, you know, of your, of your gait cycle. So Paige, I, that's my thesis. And now Paige, I can apply those lessons to my next training cycle for the spring marathon. Makes sense? So basically I'm going to incorporate, um, I'm thinking right now about twice a month mountain running in just to keep my quads strong and my calves and everything else because it did keep me healthy for about four years with respect to not having runner's knee. Um, I know I had plantar fasciitis in 2018, but anyway, Paige, great question. I hope that helps uh, give you a little uh, perspective on my approach to why I like to be my own coach. That is it for this week. Thanks for sending in your questions. Next week is gonna be Facebook and Twitter. Uh, yeah, I'll probably do both. So Facebook and Twitter, if you have questions, that's the question of the day. Ask on Facebook or Twitter. If you post them down below, I probably won't grab from them this week, all right? Or for next week, all right? Thanks for being here, thanks for watching. We're gonna to toss it back, of course, to Q and A's on the right and the left in case you missed the last two weeks and you wanna dive more into training running shoes, nutrition, stretching, all that good stuff. That'll be on the right and left. All right, see beauty, work hard, and love each other. See you tomorrow.